So today I'm going to talk about hypernatremia. My name is Adrian Bode. I'm the second year T2 renal module course director. So first, let's talk about urinary concentration. Renal concentration, or excuse me, renal concentrating mechanisms are the first line of defense. Okay, so there are two main steps to prevent hypernatremia. So we're going to discuss when these steps can go awry. The first is uh, the urinary concentrating mechanisms. So this is really the first line of defense against water depletion. The second of which is thirst, which we'll talk about in a little bit. As far as renal concentration goes, there are multiple uh, mechanisms to this, which you guys can read in your uh, book. I'm not going to get too in-depth in it today, because we will discuss this uh, when we get into our smaller groups. But the first thing is, in a thick ascending loop of Henle, there's reabsorption of sodium via the sodium potassium 2 chloride co-transporter. And this is really important for the generation of the medullary uh, hypertonicity, and this provides the energy for later urea uh, reabsorption into the medulla, which we talked about in over number two. And finally, we need ADH to be present so that we can actually concentrate the urine. So once ADH is our um, ADP is present, aquaporin two channels are then inserted into the cell membrane, and then water is able to be reabsorbed via its concentration gradient uh, through the principal cell into the urea-rich hypertonic uh, medullary space. So now for the final and most important defense against hypernatremia is thirst. So essentially if there's any problem in the urinary concentrating mechanisms, whether it's loop diuretics, uh, blocking and reabsorption of sodium with thick ascending loop, or lack of ADH, which then uh, prevents the reabsorption of water in a collecting duct, we can always prevent hypernatremia by... Uh, prevent hyponatremia by just drinking more water. So ADH release is stimulated by a high plasma, excuse me, plasma osmolarity, uh, as is thirst. Basically, the mechanism for ADH release via the osmoreceptors uh, are a little earlier, right after 280, maybe like 283 um, osms, whereas thirst comes a lot later, closer to 293. So normally the only way we can develop hypernatremia is if our thirst mechanism is disabled for whatever reason. Okay. So now that we're seeing a change in the serum sodium, I realistically it's going to be a change in the water that's the problem. Normally, as we stated before, thirst prevents against hyponatremia. Even patients with diabetes insipidus who have no ADH, well, can have normal serum sodiums if they have access to water. So normally the people who actually get hyponatremia are those who don't have access to water. That's going to be patients with altered mental status, patients intubated in ICU, and very young children who aren't able to ask or get water. So there are basically two large etiologies for why someone would develop hyponatremia. The first of which is increased water losses with no access to free water. And the second being administration of hypertonic saline or sodium bicarbonate. When it comes to increased water losses, there really are two places that you can lose free water. It's going to be the GI tract. The other possible source will be from the kidneys and those will be urinary losses. And we can see that with diabetes insipidus, whether it's central or... Uh, nephrogenic, and we can see it with osmotic diuresis, normally due to glucose, but we can occasionally see it in the mannitol. Occasionally, we can see uh, increased water losses uh, from insensible or sw and sweat losses, and this really is pre prevalent excuse me, uh, when patients have fever or infections, and their insensible losses are increased dramatically. So the clinical features of hypernatremia are similar to those of hyponatremia in that they appear to be uh, neurologic in nature, and they have to do with osmotic changes in the brain. 
So then those are muscle weakness, confusion, and coma. Uh, these patients tend to be thirsty in order to prevent from being hypernatremic. Uh, and occasionally, a lot of the times, they'll have polyuria. So when it comes to diagnosing hypernatremia, first off, the patients will be hypernatremic. You check a serum sodium uh, via any serum chemistry, we'll see that they'll have a sodium greater uh, than 146. Now, in this setting, these patients are normally almost always hypertonic because the plasma osmolarity is similar to two times uh, our serum sodium. So anytime a patient is hypernatremic, they will almost always be hypertonic. One of the ways we can uh, differentiate the different etiologies of hypernatremia is uh, to check the urine osms during water deprivation. If the urine osms are greater than 500, we think that these are GI water losses or osmotic diuresis. If we have it less than 300, we tend to think diabetes insipidus. Uh, that can be a complete central diabetes insipidus where there's absolutely no ADH release. Or nephrogenic uh, diabetes insipidus where ADH is present, but it's not able to cause a uh, release of aquaporin 2. And lastly, we check the response of ADH during the water deprivation test. We give ADH and we watch the response. As if, if this is central diabetes insipidus, there will be an increase in the urine osms as now the kidney is able to concentrate the urine. If this is nephrogenic DI in which there's already ADH present, there will be no change or at least no significant change in the urine osmolarity. With the water deprivation test, we want to see if the patients are able to concentrate their urine without access to free water. If patients have diabetes insipidus, they'll be unable to do so. With central diabetes insipidus, we see an increase in urine osms after ADH or AVP is administered versus nephrogenic DI in which there's no response to ADH uh, or AVP as these patients already have extremely high levels of ADH and AVP present, just no response in the kidney. Of note, on a water deprivation test, when we look at the urine osms, patients with primary polydipsia perform similar uh, to the above as they're able to concentrate the urine the only issue is these patients tend to have hyponatremia when you look at their serum sodium. Now there are several different causes of central diabetes insipidus. There's of course uh, congenital and there's a autosomal dominant autosomal recessive form. But commonly we see this with head trauma and brain surgery. And with the surgeries it can be due to benign brain tumors or malignant tumors themselves can actually cause central diabetes insipidus. Other than that, there can be idiopathic, it can be due to stroke or cerebrovascular accidents, granulomatous disease, or any infection of the CNS. Nephrogenic DI can also be congenital in nature, but the vast majority of times tends to be acquired. This can be due to hypokalemia, due to decrease in adenylate cyclase, or hypercalcemia, lithium, sickle cell disease, and demeclocycline, which is often used to actually treat hyponatremia due to SIDH, and finally, pregnancy. In pregnancy, this can be due to uh, vasopressinase. Again, hypernatremia is a water problem, and it tends to be a free water deficit. So what we need to do is first calculate what the free water deficit is, and then replace it. If hypernatremia develops uh, acutely, we can quickly treat it. The vast majority of hypernatremia will be acute as well. If it's chronic, then we have to take our time as there's been a shift in the osmolites. Uh, specifically, when it comes to central diabetes uh, insipidus, we give desmopressin or DDAVP, which is uh, another form of ADH, in order for the patients to concentrate their urine. When it comes to nephrogenic DI, it's a little more difficult. These patients need a low sodium diet and thiazide diuretics. And it's believed that thiazide diuretics uh, will cause an increase in proximal tubule uh, water and sodium reabsorption. 
And because there's less water and salute being delivered to the collecting duct, we'll have less water that's actually lost in the urine. So this is just a quick review of hypernatremia. Hope this helps. Thanks.